Pleasure and the Worm, Chapter 3. What a fine thing it would be, Harvey thought, to build a place like this, to drive its foundations deep into the earth, to lay its floors and hoist its walls, to say, where there was nothing, I raised a house. That would be a very fine thing. It wasn't a puffed up peacock of a place either. There were no marble steps, no fluted columns. It was a proud house, certainly, but there was nothing wrong with that. It had much to be proud of. It stood four stories high and boasted more windows than Harvey could readily count. Its porch was wide, as were the steps that led up to its carved front door. Its slated roofs were steep and crowned with magnificent chimneys and lightning rods. Its highest point, however, was neither a chimney nor a lightning rod, but a large and elaborately wrought weather vane, which Harvey was peering up at when he heard the front door open and a voice say, Harvey Swick, as, as I live and breathe, he looked down, the weather vane's white silhouette still behind his eyes, and there on the porch stood a woman who made his grandmother, the oldest person he knew, look young. She had a face like a rolled up ball of cobwebs from which her hair, which could also have been spider's work, fell in wispy abundance. Her eyes were tiny, her mouth tight, her hands gnarled. Her voice, however, was melodious and its words welcoming. I thought maybe you decided not to come, she said, picking up a basket of freshly cut flowers she'd left on the step, which would have been a pity. Come on in. There's food on the table. You must be famished. I can't stay long, Harvey said. You must do whatever you wish, came the reply. I'm Mrs. Griffin, by the way. Yes, Rictus mentioned you. I hope he didn't bend your ear too much. He loves the sound of his own voice. That and his reflection. Harvey had climbed the porch steps by now and stopped in front of the open door. This was a moment of decision, he knew, though he wasn't quite certain why. Step inside, Mrs. Griffin said, brushing a spider hair back from her furrowed brow. But Harvey still hesitated, and he might have turned around and never stepped inside the house except that he heard a boy's voice yelling, I got ya, I got ya, followed by uproarious laughter. Wendell, Mrs. Griffin said, are you chasing the cats again? The sound of laughter grew even louder, and it was so full of good humor that Harvey stepped over the threshold and into the house just so he could see the face of its owner. He only got a brief look. A goofy, bespeckled face appeared for a moment at the other end of the hallway. Then a piebald cat dashed between the boy's legs, and he was off after it, yelling and laughing. Again. He's such a crazy boy, Mrs. Griffin said, but all the cats love him. The house was more wonderful inside than out. Even on the short journey to the kitchen, Harvey glimpsed enough to know that this was a place built for games, chases, and adventures. It was a maze in which no two doors were alike. It was a treasure house where some notorious pirate had hidden his blood-stained booty. It was a resting place where carpets flowed, flown by gins and boxes sealed before the flood, where the eggs of beasts that the earth had lost were trapped and waiting for the sun's heat to hatch them. It's perfect, Harvey murmured to himself. Mrs. Griffin caught his words. Nothing's perfect, she replied. Why not? Because time passes, she went on, staring down at the flowers she'd cut, and the beetle and the worm find their way into everything sooner or later. Hearing this, Harvey wondered what grief it was Mrs. Griffin had known or seen to make her so mournful. I'm sorry, she said, covering her melancholy with a tiny smile. You didn't come here to listen to my dir dirgs. You came to enjoy yourself, didn't you? I suppose I did, Harvey said. So let me tempt you with some treats. Harvey set himself down at the kitchen table, and within 60 seconds, Mrs. Griffin had set a dozen plates of food in front of him. Hamburgers, hot dogs and fried chicken, mounds of buttered potatoes, apple, cherry, and chocolate pies, ice cream and whipped cream, grapes, tangerines, and a plate of fruits he couldn't even name. He set to eating with gusto and was devouring his second slice of pie when a freckled girl with long, frizzy blonde hair and huge blue eyes ambled in. Must be Harvey, she said. How did you know? Wendell told me. How did he know? She shrugged. He just heard. I'm Lulu, by the way. Did you just arrive? No, I've been here for ages, longer than Wendell, but not as long as Mrs. Griffin. Nobody's been here as long as she has. Isn't that right? Almost, said Mrs. Griffin, and a little mysteriously. Do you want something to eat, sweetie? 
Lulu shook her head. No, thanks. I haven't got much of an appetite at the moment. She nevertheless sat down opposite Harvey, stuck her thumb in the chocolate pie, and licked it clean. Who invited you here, she asked. A man named Rictus. Oh, yes, the one with the grin. That's him. He's got a sister and two brothers, she went on. You've met them? <laughs> Not all of them, Lulu admitted. They keep themselves to themselves, but you'll meet one or two of them sooner or later. I don't think I'll be staying, Harvey said. I mean, my mom and dad don't even know I'm here. Of course they do, Lulu replied. They just didn't tell you about it. This confused Harvey, and he said so. Call your mom and dad, Lulu suggested. Ask them. Can I do that, he wondered. Of course you can, Mrs. Griffin replied. The phone's in the hallway. Carrying a spoonful of ice cream with him, Harvey went to the phone and dialed. At first, there was a whining sound on the line, as though a wind was in the wires, then as it cleared, he heard his mom say, Who is this? Before you start yelling, he began. Oh, hello, dear, his mom cooed. Have you arrived? Arrived? You are at the holiday house, I hope. Uh, y yes, I am, but oh, good. I was worried in case you'd lost your way. Do you like it there? You knew I was coming, Harvey said, catching Lulu's eye. I told you, she mouthed. Of course we knew, his mom went on. We invited Mr. Rictus to show you the place. You look so sad, you poor lamb. We thought you needed a little fun. Really? Said Harvey, astonished by this turn of events. We just want you to enjoy yourself, his mom went on. So you stay as long as you want. Well, what about school, he said. You deserve a little time off, came the reply. Don't you worry about anything. Just have a good time. I will, mom. Bye, dear. Bye. Harvey came away from the conversation, shaking his head in amazement. You were right, he said to Lulu. They arranged everything. So now you don't have to feel guilty, said Lulu. Well, I expect I'll see you around later, huh? And with that, she ambled away. If you're finished eating, Mrs. Griffin said, I'll show you to your room. I'd like that. She duly led Harvey, duly led Harvey up the stairs at the half landing, basking on the sun-drenched window sill. On the sun-drenched window sill was a cat with fur the color of the cloudless sky. That's Blue Cat, Mrs. Griffin said. You saw Stew Cat playing with Wendell. I don't know where Clue Cat is, but he'll find you. He likes new guests. Do you have a lot of people coming here? Only children, very special children, like you and Lulu and Wendell. Mr. Hood won't have just anybody. Who's Mr. Hood? The man who built the holiday house, Mrs. Griffin replied. Will I meet him too? Mrs. Griffin looked discomfited by the question, maybe, she said, her gaze averted, but he's a very private man. They were, they were up on the landing by now, and Mrs. Griffin led Harvey past a row of painted portraits to a room at the back of the house. It overlooked an orchard, and the warm air carried the smell of ripe apples into the room. You look tired, my sweet, Mrs. Griffin said. Maybe you should lie down for a while. Harvey usually hated to sleep in the afternoon. It reminded him too much of having the flu or the measles, but the pillow looked very comfortable very cool and comfortable, and when Mrs. Griffin had taken her leave, he decided to lie down, just for a few minutes. Either he was more tired than he thought, or the calm and comfort of the house rocked him into a slumber. Whichever, his eyes closed almost as soon as he put his head on the pillow, and they did not open again until morning. <laughs>